What do you do when your boss comes up to you and hands you a pile of documents and says, hey, work some data magic on this? You use latent Dirichlet allocation or LDA to extract out the various topics, the various subjects contained within that pile of documents, and then say, hey, which document talks mostly about which topic? This technique is known as topic modeling and is useful for any kind of textual document you might have. Maybe they are emails, maybe they're SMS text messages, maybe they are customer service chats, maybe they are freeform note fields inside of an IT system. Doesn't matter. Topic modeling is wildly useful for any professional that wants to extract information out of a pile of text documents. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to use LDA to perform topic modeling on textual documents, and I'm going to use Python and Excel to do it. However, it doesn't really matter that I'm using Python and Excel because the Python code is exactly the same whether you use Python and Excel, Jupyter Notebooks, or something like VS Code. Now, if you're interested in getting the files, that includes the Excel workbook and a Jupyter Notebook, by the way, of all the Python code, check out the description below. There's a link and you can get the files. So we're off to Excel to use LDA to perform some topic modeling. So here I am in the workbook that you can download from the link in the description below. And for this video, I'm using the Kaggle BBC dataset. And if you get the files, there's also a CSV that's included in the zip file that I'll send you. So you can use this data with whatever technology you would like, for example, a Jupyter Notebook. So here's the thing. You can't really do much with raw text, not with computers anyway. You need to pre-process it. So one of the first things that we do is we want to tokenize the data. We want to take an entire text document and break it up into little chunks that the computer can actually use. And if you're interested in learning more about tokenization, check out a video. I'll put a card up here on my YouTube channel, which talks more about tokenization. So here's our data and we have raw textual data. And then the data set also includes labels. For this video, we're going to pretend like labels don't exist because we're actually going to say, look, I just have a pile of documents and I want to extract various topics out of it. So we're just going to use this column right here, which is just the raw text data for each document. So let's go ahead and see the Python code. So here's the Python code. It's included in the workbook that you get with the files for this video. And what we can see here is something very simple. I'm just using the Excel function, which is the gateway for getting data out of an Excel workbook into Python and Excel. And I'm essentially just loading all the rows and all the columns of the BBC data table that we just saw on the other worksheet. So if I run this by hitting Control Enter, what I will get is some output and let me go ahead and make this easier for you to see. And what we can see right here is that our data frame, our table of data is 2,225 entries or 2,225 documents. And we have a couple columns, which we saw earlier, which is our data, our raw textual data, and then the labels, which we're gonna ignore for this video. So moving on, the next step that we need to do is we need to tokenize the data. And not only do we need to tokenize the data, but we're also gonna transform it using a calculation known as term frequency, inverse document frequency, or TFIDF. Let's take a look at that code here. And this is the code for doing this. And I'm not going to go through the TFIDF calculation. If you're interested in learning more about the Mighty TFIDF, check out this video. I'll put a card up here on my YouTube channel, which talks more about the Mighty TFIDF. So this code here is going to go ahead and tokenize our documents, break them up into these logical chunks that we can then use the computer to work with, and then perform the TFIDF calculation. Now, what's super important about this is, is that we're going to use some parameters here as we tokenize the data and transform it using TFIDF to control the number of columns that we have. And specifically, what we're going to do is say, hey, Python, only keep those words, those tokens. That's what they are, really. Tokens are just words. Those words in the document that appear in at least five documents. Because there might be some bizarre terms like mononucleosis, for example, that don't show up except for maybe one of the documents. So you don't really want that included because it's so rare that it's not necessarily that useful. And what that does is allows us to constrain the number of columns that we have. And then we also say, hey, only keep the words or the tokens that are in 75% or less of the documents. Because words that occur very commonly in every document, so for example, in the English language, the word the appears basically everywhere because it's the single most common word in the English language. It's not particularly useful. So very common words will actually not show up. And then lastly, what we're doing here is we're removing stop words. And stop words are very common grammatical words in languages that don't actually add a lot of value. 
like the word the, like I just mentioned, that is a stop word. It's the by far the most common word in the English language, and it also doesn't really tell you anything about what's going on in the document. So stop words plucks out things like the and is and an in the English language. So then we instantiate our TF-IDF vectorizer. So this is the class that performs the tokenization, removes the stop words, gets rid of words that are very rare or super common, and then turns all these scores into TF-IDF. And like I said, there's that video you can check out if you want to learn more. We then ask the vectorizer object object to actually fit and transform. Fit means go learn from the data. Transform means apply what you learn. So go look at the BBC textual data, break it out into tokens, little words, throw out the stuff that's really rare, throw out the stop words, throw out anything that's really super common that appears in more than 75% of the documents, and then return it back as what's known as a document term matrix. And you can think of this just basically as a table where every row is going to be one of our BBC documents, and the columns are going to be our individual tokens or our individual words. So words like great in Britain or united in states, things like that. And inside of each cell will be the TF-IDF score. And if I run this code, what we'll get back is a output that shows us the rows and columns. And what you can see here is we have 2,225 rows, which makes sense, right? That's the amount of documents we have. And then the columns, we have our 9,323. <laughs> 9,323 columns. This would be much bigger if we hadn't set the, the threshold to say, look, a word's got to show up in at least five documents and it can't show up in more than 75% of the documents. So when you're doing text analytics, you have very, very wide columns, usually much wider than you have rows most often because there are so many unique words and documents. Okay, so now we have our raw data. It's in a format, it's in a tabular matrix format that we can use to perform topic modeling using LDA. So let's take a look at that code. Now, what we've got going on here is we're using latent Dirichlet allocation. And you can see that right here. This is the class from Scikit-Learn that allows us to perform the topic modeling. And at a high level, LDA works by taking your documents and then you say, okay, LDA, I got a pile of documents. I want you to find five topics, let's say. Find five topics out of it. And what LDA does at a really super high level is it takes your documents and tries to reverse engineer what kinds of topics would potentially generate the document set that you've got. So think of it this way. I have a collection of documents and I say find five topics and LDA tries to engineer, if you will, a machine, a manufacturing process that says, look, this manufacturing process, it would produce documents that look very much like the documents that Dave gave me. And if that sounds a bit abstract, there are some links in the description below for some YouTube videos that are really, really good at explaining LDA. So if you want to learn more about the LDA algorithm, check it out, check those links out. Using LDA, you have to decide how many topics that you want to find. LDA does not determine that for you. So this is very much a unsupervised machine learning technique, much like K-means, if you're familiar with that, or if you checked out my video on K-means clustering of documents, you have to tell the algorithm up front how many things to find. So we're going to find five topics. And then what we do is we say, okay, let's go ahead and create our LDA model here so that you see the same thing in the files if you run them yourself that you see in the video. I'm setting the random state. Otherwise, I'm setting the number of components, which just means the number of topics to find. So five in this case. And then what we do, once again, is we call fit transform. This is a scikit-learn naming convention. Go learn everything from the data and then transform it. And what I provided is my doc term matrix. This is the thing that came out of the TF-IDF vectorizer, where every row is a document and every column is a word, and the values in the cells are the TF-IDF scores. And then what I get back is a, another matrix, another table, where every row is the document, and then my columns are actually the topics. And then the cells are actually the score. So this is a bit abstract, so let me show you what I mean here. So what I'm gonna do is run the rest of this code, and all it does essentially is perform the LDA and then format a data frame so that we can look at the results. And looking at the data frame will be super intuitive. And LDA is not a speedy process, so if you are using this in your own work and you're using it with more data, you probably wanna up the Python timeout. So let's go ahead and close down the formula bar and look, we get a data frame. So if I click on the card here, what we can see here is that we found five topics and I just labeled them topics one through five. Technically in Python, they're just zero, one, two, three, and four because Python counts from zero, but that's not really human friendly. So we have topic one, topic two, topic five. Each row is one of my documents. And then inside of the cell is the allocation of how much the document is relevant to a particular topic or if you will, how much does a document talk about a particular topic? 
So for example, this particular document right here, the first document, has about 90% match, if you will, to topic one, and then smaller amounts. And you can think of these as percentages because if you add up all these values, they add up to one. What's interesting is that you can actually have documents that are split. So take a look at this guy right here. So this document is 46%-ish of topic one and 46%-ish of topic three. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but kind of does if you think about it. Because a lot of documents actually talk about many ideas simultaneously. They may be focused on certain things, like maybe this document right here is like super focused on one thing, but that's not always the case. So this is super awesome because it allows us to understand some of the gray areas of human communication, human language. Now, next up, we have to say, what is topic one? What is topic four? And the next code cell will do this. So let me go ahead and click on that cell. And what we can see here is some code where I just iterate through the topic model and grab out essentially the scores for the words by the topic. So we can say here, I'm gonna display the top 10 words. So you can just change this code if you want the top 15 words, the top 20 words or whatever it is for each topic. I then go through the components, which is from my object. And what I get is the topic and the words in the topic. Okay, as two objects. And then what I do is I just perform some calculations and I do some string formatting. And if I run this code, you can see here the top words per topic. So Mr. Film, Best, Year, New, World, Time, Election, Game, People, Blog, Blogs, Tyndall, Journals, Blogger, Blogs, Spaces, Lucy, Technorati, <laughs> Technorati, Wembley, so here's the thing, right? As with most of these unsupervised learning algorithms that you typically use in real-world analytics, the computer can't really understand what's going on. Not really. So these topics essentially say, hey, human, you need to go figure out what these topics mean. So obviously this particular topic is about blogging. What you need to do as a human being is say, look, I need to extract out these topics. I need to look at them, figure out what they mean based on the context of my business process, and then say, okay, which document is most affinitized by the scores that we saw in the previous cell to the particular topics. And that's how you can extract a lot of information out of it. One thing that you might be wondering is, geez, Dave, if I have to tell the algorithm how many topics to find, how do I figure that out? And let me show you one technique to help you out with that. And that's what's known as using the perplexity score. So let me go ahead and open up the formula bar and we'll go to this particular cell. So here we have some code to calculate the perplexity score. And this is just a heuristic, it's a rule of thumb. Because once again, the computer can't definitively tell how many topics are actually in a collection of documents. It just says, look, based on all the words and all the documents, I can find probabilistically speaking what the topics tend to look like, but I don't know for sure how many topics there really are. So the perplex perplexity score, excuse me, is all about characterizing how good the model fits that idea of like, I'm creating a machine that generates the documents that Dave gave me and lower scores are better. So you can think of this as kind of like being the error. So the lower the score, the better. So what we do is we just go through a range of topic values from two to 10 and then calculate a score for each. And then we just store them in an empty list and then we can actually do interesting things with them. And there is a method on the LDA object that allows you to calculate perplexity. So if I run this, I'll get the scores and there's not really much to see. So what we'll do is we'll actually plot the scores where we'll have on the X axis, we'll have the number of topics and on the Y axis, we'll have the perplexity score. <laughs> perplexity score, excuse me. <laughs> now this also takes a little bit of time to run, so as you increase your data size, you're gonna to wanna to up the timeout in Excel for your Python formulas. And that's done running. So what we can do here is actually check out this code. And all this code is doing is using the mighty Seaborn library just to create a line chart. So if I run this code, and then let me close the formula bar down, let me close my diagnostics pane down. And if I right click, picture and cell, create a reference, I get a line chart. Now, what I said earlier was lower scores of perplexity are better than higher scores. And what we can see here is, Whoop, it just goes up. Now, if you start increasing this to very large numbers of topics, you'll start to see some weird performance going on. So what you need to do essentially is use this as a guidepost. It's not gonna definitively tell you, Dave, there are only two topics in this particular corpus, this particular collection of documents. That's what corpus means. So you have to kind of look at this uh, with a grain of salt and actually interpret it. And in general, what you end up doing is you end up looking at, to be quite honest, a number of topics that is tractable for you. <laughs> Because maybe you'd plot this out and it says there are 125 topics. It's really hard for you to do an analysis on 125 topics. Not only that, but more importantly, 
it's going to be hard to tell your boss about 125 topics. They're probably not going to have the patience for it. So what you do is you use this and you kind of look at it and you're like, okay, uh, I definitely need to have a few topics in here, but I don't want to have too many. So I will pick an amount that seems reasonable to achieve my business goals of explainability of what's going on. Unlike a lot of my other tutorials, I have no slides about the LDA topic modeling process. And the reason for that, quite frankly, is other people have done it better already on YouTube. So what I've done, as I've mentioned earlier, is include some links in the description below to a two-part tutorial on YouTube, which is great. So if you wanna learn more about the LDA topic modeling, the algorithm, how it works, check those videos out. My next video in this series is going to be about one of the best machine learning algorithms that's out there. And of course, I'm talking about the mighty random forest. If you want to use machine learning algorithms to have more impact at work, you can't go wrong learning how to use the mighty random forest. When that video is ready, it'll show up here on the screen as a tile. And in the meantime, I'll put up another one of my Python and Excel machine learning videos in case you're interested. Until next time, please stay healthy and I wish you very happy data sleuthing.